It's been a year since Hamas's brutal attack on Israel on October the 7th. Today, Prime Minister Keir Starmer called it the darkest day in Jewish history since the Holocaust. The impact has been felt across the world, including here in the UK, where alongside mourning the dead, the Jewish community has faced unprecedented levels of anti-Semitism in the wake of Israel's response. So how are British Jews here feeling a year on? And what are their hopes for the future? I'm Lucrezia Minerini and this is what you need to know. Hello and welcome to today's episode of What You Need to Know and I'm joined by ITV News reporter Sam Holden. Sam, you have spent lots of time with the Jewish community here. I know you've made uh, several films, haven't you? But the past year, obviously, undeniably challenging uh, for the Jewish community. Um, your, your thoughts, I suppose, and your, just some of your insights from talking to people. Well, it's hard to unpack in mm. a 15 minute podcast because, um, of course, there's a huge variety of different opinions within the Jewish community. But definitely October 7th has had a profound impact. I mean, let's start with the day itself. Mm. Whatever people here in the Jewish community, whatever their opinions are on the Israeli government, the Israeli military, the Israeli state, people here know people who live in Israel. 40% of the world's Jewish population does live in Israel. So October 7th was quite a personal moment for lots of British Jews. They knew people who were killed or they knew people who knew people who were killed. So there's been a huge amount of grief and mourning and trauma associated with that day and then the year that's followed. So, so that's one element, the kind of pain of the day itself. Mm. What's followed, and if we're talking specifically from with regards to the Jewish community here, is a sense of fear. Um, people are scared because every time, and we've seen this come true, every time that Israel is involved in conflict, that you know there's war in the Middle East, that Palestinian civilians are killed, British Jews face repercussions. Yeah, and you, you know, you, we can point to actual statistics because we got figures out just last week saying there were more than 5,500 anti-Semitic incidents in the UK last year. I mean, just talk us through some examples of anti-Semitism that Jewish people are facing on a daily basis. Look, first of all, I think what's really important, you hear five and a half thousand mm. and it sounds like a lot, but then you've got to bear in mind the Jewish community in the UK is tiny. Yeah. It's 280,000 people roughly. Mm. So that is a huge proportion of the community being affected by anti-Semitic incidents. It ranges from the very obvious people being violently beaten, you know, swastikas being daubed onto Jewish properties. And then it's, I guess, more daily intimidation. Look, I was verbally abused last week uh, in front of my family, with my friends. We, we had babies and grandparents with us by a group of teenagers who felt absolutely emboldened to come up and teenagers, just, yeah, just, just launch anti-Semitic abuse. Without going into too much detail, language that might you know offend people, but what kinds of things yeah, are you Yeah, I mean, to? using... Um, talking about Hitler mm. and, and Nazis. And then when when we questioned why they were saying that, they, they said, what are you going to do, bomb us? Mm. Um, you know, clear inference to to what's happening in Gaza as if as a random British Jewish person, mm. that's got something to do with me, which it doesn't. Um, so I think a lot of people have experienced that. I've interviewed somebody this week who was on the tube and got called a Muslim killer and... Um, was the person opposite him said, I hate you, I hate the way you look, I hate everything about you, uh, I hate your religion. So what you're now seeing as a result of these daily kind of abuses is that people are trying to hide their Jewish identity. Mm. I spoke to a group of school children. They no longer wear the Star of David on their neck, which is a Jewish symbol. Yes, it's used by the State of Israel, but it is primarily a Jewish symbol yep. and has been for thousands of years. Mm. They won't wear those necklaces because they're they're fearful that if they are identified as Jewish, that is enough to justify abuse or, or assault. Well, the people you speak to as well, I mean, you say that these little kids that are not wearing Star of David anymore. I mean, children, we're talking about children here. I mean, are they, are they and their families just, they're changing what they would normally ordinarily do in their lives, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. I think they are hiding anything that identifies them as Jewish. Yeah. So that might be taking off a skull cap, um, or a kippah, and instead wearing a cap, which is more inconspicuous. Um, I mean, one of the teenagers I spoke to, she's still in school. She went on work experience 
and she was in a group of people and somebody there said to her that the Nazi concentration camps were a great thing and, and not one person stood up mm. and said anything. And I think that's what's been particularly hard for the community this year yeah. is a lack of solidarity, is that when these incidents happen, mm. it feels like people aren't really listening or, or, or standing up for the Jewish community. Why do you think that is? What is behind that, that lack of solidarity, as you say? What is it that, you know, someone can hear someone say that to another person and just not say anything, not speak up? I mean, it's really complex yeah. and, and it's actually a really difficult topic to look into that you could probably spend a whole series uh, of podcasts looking into. Yeah. I think part of it is that people are so emotive about what's happening. Understandably, yeah. people see what's happening in Gaza and they feel so emotive about it and they're so upset at what's happening that, that it becomes almost absolutist. You fall into one camp or the other. Yeah. If, if you're against what's going on in Gaza, then you're so furious at the Israelis and you can't do anything towards the Israelis. So the proxy is the British Jewish community because they're both Jewish. And, you know, the Jews here have a lot of connections with Israel. But but that's just the connections are that they know people who live there. They're not they don't have any say over the political or military objectives of that country. And that's the point, isn't it? I mean, the, you know, we can look at the acts of the, the state of Israel but, you know, why does that embolden people to, yeah, target all Jewish people? Exactly. And it, it's, it's been like this for a long time, though, hasn't it? And, of course, it's all now last year of conflict and what's happened since October the 7th. It has. It, last year's the worst yeah. ever. I mean, most people I spoke to said it was the worst year mm. um, they could ever remember. Look, there are some people in the Jewish community who probably do support what the Israeli government and military is doing. There are those that are completely against it and go on the marches every week. Mm -hmm. There is a plurality of thought within the Jewish community here, all different stances when it comes towards Israel. But it seems that it's often painted as this monolith that just has one opinion and supports genocide. That, that's the argument that's made. The Jewish community here supports genocide. And it's just, it's just not true. And I think, you know, let's look at the marches, for example, yes. because that's something that got brought up by a lot of people I spoke to for mm -hmm. this report I'm doing. Yeah. Um, that there are Jewish people who go on the pro-Palestine marches. I think what's been painful is the fact that although the f number of anti-Semitic placards might be low, the fact that they're able to be carried without people who are also on the march stopping those individuals and telling them to take down the marches feels like, mm -hmm. like anti-Semitism isn't being taken seriously and that if that was any other community who, who, you know, if there was racist signs, even if there was two, three racist signs in a whole out of hundreds of thousands, then everybody else would tell the people carrying them to put them down and that it wasn't acceptable mm -hmm. and, and that's not being reciprocated. Yeah, um, you spoke to a group of mums, didn't you, um, who since October 7th have actually given birth, they've had babies since then. Um, what's uh, been their experience though, bringing a, a Jewish baby into the world since all this has been happening? I think it's been really hard. Mm. Um, all the mums I spoke to are scared. They're scared about sending their children to a Jewish nursery because there have been threats before against Jewish nurseries. Um, they're scared that they might be attacked while they're out with their child. But I think there's also this sense that a lot of Jewish people feel, or people I've spoken to over the past year, that they're expected to be almost like spokespeople for the community, yeah. that they're supposed to have an answer about why Israel's doing what it mm. does and 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 apologise for what's happening in Gaza. It's interesting you say that because we spoke earlier and it's, it's similar to when there has been, for example, we've seen the past terrorist attacks that, that may be Islamist attacks. And we expect people from the Muslim community to say, well, we stand against this kind of... Well, they didn't do it. Exactly. It, you know, it's, it's, exactly. it's very similar in that respect, isn't it? Exactly. And one of the mums I spoke to kind of sums it up perfectly. She says, I don't want to be a spokesperson. I just want to be a normal mum. Yeah. I don't want to have to consider this. Mm. She is not a politician. It's not a. She, she's not a representative of, of of geopolitics. She's just a random Jewish woman who lives in London and her family's lived here for generations. Yeah. Why is she expected to have to speak out about mm. this? It's it's not related to her. I mean, we are seeing the opposite as well. We're seeing, for example, attacks on on Muslim women, aren't we? We have uh, women having the hijabs pulled off. We, we're seeing. We're hearing about it all the time, aren't we? Um, how do we stop this? I mean, because it is incredibly nuanced, isn't it? How do we uh, educate people? 
I suppose it's yeah, it's it's an endless question, isn't it? It is. Um, look, obviously, community outreach programs mm. have impact, and you know, community leaders coming out and speaking has an impact. But I think on like a, the, the most simple level is that is that you know, grief and sadness about each situation, about Gaza, about October seventh, mm. they're not mutually exclusive. You you can be upset about what's happening in Gaza and still be upset that people were killed on October seventh. I think one issue that often comes up uh, amongst the community is why people rip down posters of the hostages. Mm, yes. How does ripping down the poster of someone who's been taken hostage have, what, what does that say? What does that achieve? It will have how, no effect on the actions of, of Israel. Exactly, that is sure. exactly. Yes. And how does that, you know, stop Palestinian children being killed in Gaza. It, it doesn't make sense, mm. but it seems almost like you have to fall down on one side and you can't have sympathy for the other. Mm. So really, you know, just m better understanding of both sides, mm. you know, better understanding that the, the human toll, the death toll, the pain has been incredible on both sides yeah. would hopefully lead to, I don't know, be be you know, people here in the UK mm. not having to be so personally affected by what's happening thousands of miles away. And, you know, you're Jewish, I'm not Jewish. I'd like to think if I heard, I was out with you and your family and someone had a go at you and your family, that I would kind of say something, you know, and because we're all part of the same community. And I, I don't know, I think, well, what do we do? Would it have helped if I'd said something, if I was at do you, I do think you know so. I, yeah. I think there is that sense that, look, and sometimes people are too scared to speak up because, yeah, you know, there is that. we don't want to get in the crossfire, basically. Mm. But I think, yeah, if, if people started calling, just in the same way people should call out Islamophobia, should call out racism, these are obvious things. Mm. Calling out anti-Semitism, it, it's just, it's so obviously what people should be doing in this situation. And that I think that there's this this kind of idea that that, you know, let's say on a march, if you see something and you call it out, it, it attracts too much negative attention and then the whole march gets tarred with the same brush. Mm, yeah. But but really, at the end of the day, British people from whatever background, from whatever religion, shouldn't be scared to express their identity on the streets here for fear of being attacked. And that's really what it comes down to. And we should all be concerned about that because, because if it can happen for one community, it can happen for any community. Yeah, I think that's a very important uh, takeaway from this, um, Sam. Thank you so much. Always fascinating to talk to you. And uh, just to say uh, thank you all for, for watching and for listening. Uh, but for more on uh, this and the fallout of October the 7th, please head to our website. And of course, have a look back through our other quick briefings on a range of headline topics to find out what you need to know. Until the next time, thanks for listening.